Hi, this is Ganawa with Nikki, uh, Stream 3, and we're going to be talking about Maumas, Mokademas, and Ganawia. Malamas are women who have mastered the Gangri. There's not necessarily a, a term yet for women who are masters, and that's from people who are in Ganawa themselves. Noha El Maknasi, a relative of Malam Abdembi El Maknasi, is taking us through the real time navigation of women in this tradition, central to the organization to it, who have been most of the hosts for Al Maluk or the spirits within Ganawa. Yet, when they become masters in the musician's sphere, now we have words like Malama, Malama. And this is what we're going to be exploring in this session. Mokadema are the priestess summoner. They are the women who organize everything for the Lila, literal backbone to Ganawa, consider Mokadema's to be the spiritual band manager. We all have Almuk inside of us. You, me, everyone. But we don't know. When we get sick, or when we attend the Lila, we learn about it. Mokadema Zaida Ganya, 2007. Majority of hosts for spirits, or the Jin, Junun, are women. Why is that? Women's role within Ganawa as seers and clairvoyant is not just a gendered role, it's a chosen one. It's chosen both by the spirits and by the adepts themselves. So we're going to check out uh, Banat Ganya and uh, Hadar of Esawera. Hadra, it means present. The Hadre have the presence of spirit. This is why Zaida, the Mokadama Lipan, very observant, wise, powerful woman in Ganawa. She's just so surreal and the role that she has filled as a Mukadema, much with Malems, is invaluable. Worth someone has as a spiritual conjurer as a Mukadema, Zaida, is definitely in a tier of her own. Um, it's ancestral for her. Her mother was a Mukadema as well, and she attended Lila's as a little girl. So that knowledge passed down, and she inherited it very young and took it with great seriousness. This would be a life mission for their entire family, and it still is. Zaida said that her ancestral grandfather was a Senegalese healer who was brought to Morocco for the purpose of afflictions and keeping them away. The Ghania family still has ties to Western Africa, even though they're Moroccan. And it can be said for many Ganawa that the history is lived as much as the sun. Zaida and her daughter. Zaida is part of the Hadera, and they are a taifa, a group who are not necessarily a tariqa, a sect of um, Sufi Islam, whereas the Aisawa and the Hamadsha have, you could say, a centralized leader where they take their, their spiritual guidance from. The Ganawa do not, and that is due to the displacement from the lands eastward of Morocco and Niger and Al-Salam and the formerly known as the Songhai Empire, which is now Mali and uh, Senegal and Gambia, etc. Closeness to groups such as the Hamad Shah and the Aisawa is why um, two songs 
for Aisha are now included in Ganawa from the Hamaja Brotherhood. Why are they so influenced by one another? Well, they will worship the same saints, such as Muley of Del Kader Jilali. We'll talk more about the crossover between those traditions and the Ganawa spirit, Alani Muna, later. I think it's a really beautiful connection that a bond that needs to be explored further. From the Hagadats of Asawira to the Banat Ganawa and Banat Timbuktu and Banat Toariat, there are women throughout Ganawa who have been there for decades and women in the musical suites, women as devotees in the depths, they have retained the knowledge of the ceremonies, they have protected the zawiyas, and they continue to conduct lilas in their home. Women are Ganawa. Ganawa beliefs in history. Roots reach to Gao. They reach to, as I said, the Songhai Empire, that's the Tamali, that's parts of Niger, that's Guinea, that is much of Western Africa. And from the Togo, who are nomadic Chadian tribe, to the Wolof, there are many ethnic groups that are considered to be part of Ganawa. And you can hear them in the musical anthology that is kept in the tradition. Because their roots are Bambara, Hausa communities, and the Soloke, and the Songkai, and the Wodabe, now, they resemble Black Moroccans because they are the ancestors to Black Moroccans. The women that you see and you hear, they resemble Black Moroccans because they are linked by their heritage. It is just over the course of a diasporic millennia and more, throughout the different styles, the cities, and you could say transformations of Ganawa from the secret to now the, the profane Lila, which is public and for everyone to experience, whereas knowledge was more guarded before. We said in last session, Kufan Kanawa is the medieval site in Zander. Kanawa is the word that you hear in older Ganawa songs because it is closer tied to the Hausa roots in these lands. This is Salama Dumai once again, and she's a gourmet player from Nigeria. She's playing a Ganawa prototype, and we really think you should hear this. The gourmet can easily be linked to the Gembri, but it can also be tied to the Gambar from Senegal. <laughs> of women playing gourmets that sound incredibly similar to Gembri's today, but that is ancestral memory for you. The ancestral Ganawa route will take you through Erechevia, Tengir, Marrakesh, Karudan, Awazazet, Agadir, Safi, Rabat, Saleh, Fez, Meknes, then to Tangier. Casablanca is included as well. There's so many paths included in that overall path from 
West Africa through Algeria and Bashar, which is the main birthplace for Ganawa, all the way to the northern tip of Morocco. As the Ganawa stopped in each place and would define the history and the culture of each place, their attitudes about the authenticity of Ganawa would change and their lives would forever change too. They would inscribe the hurt that they felt from their experience of slavery into a spiritual and musical belief system that I still am fascinated by um, all these years later. It's been about 12 to 15 years since I've learned of Ganawa, and there's still so much that needs to be properly explained and decolonized. Even for me, who I'm ever getting closer to my African roots and really trying to step back from the Western uh, worldview, which is why it's taking some time for these streams to come out. There's a lot of knowledge to consolidate, and there's also a moment in which you're like, well, maybe it's time for someone else to do this research, but then maybe it's time for us all to appreciate what's been learned as well. Nawa, who are 80 to 90 years old, who remember walking across the Sahara Desert. Randy Weston, they're creating this music, he said, where these rhythms come from. These instruments, their instruments, are the basic ones that we know as gambrays. And I don't think it's necessarily just one instrument that became the hot food or the spear. Rather, it was several, and they all blended into an incredibly complex and gorgeous instrument. One that only the spirit masters could use. If you want the full ancestral Ganala route, by the way, you can always check out the second stream, and that's cities, diasporas, and dual identity. So you can have a child with your master and share the same faith. It was no guarantee that you or they could be free. Ganala women were subject to this and many other uncomfortable expectations as participants in rock patriarchy and concubinage, unfortunately. Their masters now transcend physical slavery, and this is historically contextual. Many Ganawa songs speak of the shift from just becoming a member of the marketplace as a slave to the marketplace becoming the cosmos. And the Toraba mirrors the Moroccan souk in the sense that they sold artisanal crafts and fabric and grain in the morning but then they would transfer to a, a slave market by the afternoon and the evening. So the opening refers to the opening of the market for the Ganawa to be sold, but it also refers to the official opening of the Lee Leslie in which Al Maluk are welcome and the space is ready for them. Ganawa songs refer to Marabout, local saints, and overall Muslim saints. You can hear of Sidi Bilal, the first Muzan, or the ones who make the call to prayer, the Adhan. You can hear of the Shorafa and the Prophet Muhammad himself, Nabi, and Lala Fatima, his daughter. The Ganawa have used a reversal of time to reclaim their power. It's as if when the Leela began, it's turning back the clock on the market that sold them. And the sacred ceremony begins at night and often closes in the morning for some, though some would also say that closing a Leela by the morning is, is too early and it doesn't allow the spirit time. Those hours in which the market would sell Africans and then try to retain legitimacy for the grain market was considered as important a place as a mosque. You could swear there and have it mean as much as swearing upon the Quran. Ganawa's metaphysical progression with pre-existent memories 
truly creates a, a complex and multi-generational conversation about race and religion and existence itself and African history. Who are they? Why do they fulfill these customs? What causes them to rise uh, during possession? What even creates Jedva or trance? What gives you hal or blessing, baraka, from God? Questions that I believe all who are part of Ganawa want to know, and some do know. Others of us are privileged enough to listen. But as it stands currently, this is a journey through different identities and states of being in both the physical and the spiritual world. And it's, it's eerie and it's incredibly beautiful and unique. Islam and the definition of women's roles do affect Morocco. Yeah, agency has been passionately claimed in Ganawa and throughout Morocco, well, not just for this particular taifa. Uh, life beyond these sex might show more dichotomy between gender and sex. But here within Ganawa, there's far less separation that exists. Daughters learn possession dances. They learn how to conjure from their parents. They learn how to play the gambri from their fathers in some cases. And Lilas might be their first memory, as Simola Ganawi has said, and as Mokadama Zaida said too. What must it be like to have your first tangible thought, your first sound be the Karkaba and the Sentir, calling Amaluf, perhaps Lala Mimuna or Sibi Mimun? Perhaps intimidating, but enlightening. Ganawa, Ganawias, women in Ganawa, Adarat, and Hawariya all transform their cosmogony and their generational trauma into ceremonial healing. This is why I respect Mokadema's and women in Ganawa, brave and vulnerable to take the experience of slavery and to transmute it into a healing and nourishing experience in which others can also benefit and you're welcoming them into your your space and you're lifting them up from their afflictions and their pain in a way that they are no longer affected and they are spiritually protected by the blessings that have been given during the Lila, during the ceremony that's been provided. There is really nothing quite like having someone hold a Lila for you. That is why people hire Mokadema. Often it's for sick clientele and others who are not quite sure if traditional medical care will cure them. They are ready and they're open to other means of medicine and they're willing to try Ganawa folk medicine. Masu is the first initiation from a spirit. Uh, Maskun is the occupation at the second stage. And Rebet is the last stage, true full connection with the beyond, with the other side. And you can achieve this as an adept after several years of practice. So some Mokadema's, Malams, etc., are chosen from youth. Um, it truly depends, and there's no exact art to who is a vessel. It's simply communicated in a way where you know and others know too, oh, they were chosen. Mokadema's control spirits while being physically controlled by them. In the beginning, there was only black earth, sea in the night, and dunia, a primeval serpent's egg. Their yoke was released by Hajjaj, uh, dueling whirlwinds. And this heavenly trio 
uh, the red yolk, the black, and the white that cascaded upon the ancient earth, the rocks of the earth. And there, those tears would create the seven earth and the seven heaven. So there's seven celestial earth, and then there's seven heaven. And the serpent Duny, I believe, tried to penetrate heaven. And upon their head would be the turban of the seven colors, the seven colors of the Ganawas. I'll explain more about that later, but that's a basic retelling of the Ganawas' worldview and how creation began for them. It is interwoven with Islam, but it's also separately and proudly West African as well. We gathered that research about Ganawa's origin stories from a book called The Nomadic Alternative. And you can find the links to all of this research at the bottom of the page there. The sacred three-stringed lute, the Gembri, is made from poplar wood, though you can use other woods too, mahogany, etc. Poplar just has the most resonance, according to Maven. Camel and goat part intestines for the strains, skin for the body of the gambri, and a removable sorcera or a sistrum that's at the top of the neck, and it has rings on it. It's a primeval bond between the maker and the natural world. And it's the same for the karkaba, too, because cowhide lace ties the castanets together. It's a conscious decision to use a cow because it's part of the sacrificial ceremony for Ganawa Nahair. We alluded to Malmas and the evolving role of women in Ganawa as they are more confident and skillful in the Gembri and the musical art. Noha says this. Playing the Gambri doesn't give the title mom. It doesn't mean it's out of reach, but you have to follow and pass the step. You have to learn and know a lot of things, and at least the majority of traditions and art in the Ganawa, and especially have full spirituality. I put in brackets Malma because this name does not yet exist in the Ganawa, and we have to find the right term for this. We can call it, for example, Ganawia. Ganavia or Molua. Not to forget that the door is open to women by my humble self, McNasty, by forming the first female group in 2009 and brought them to play on several scenes and festivals in Morocco. Otherwise, anyone will hold a gambri in hand. We will call them Malem, even though they are not great artists in their field. She also takes us through the glossary of Ganawa term. Malem, the master ceremony. Koyo is the practice. And Faraja is the entertainment slash practice. Lada is the procession through rock and streets, the beginning of the Lila. Torka is the method and the knowledge of Ganawa and the rituals. Jadba is the state of trance. Gasa is a special ceremony feast for Malen's initial Lila. Also important, and Mokadamas keep track of this as well. One of their many duties is to ensure that the Nubat or the musical suites follow a specific order of text so that Al Maluk are not angered and the proper healing process can begin. Suites are left out, or if they're played out of order, then there can be great danger. What danger, right? What happens when you transgress again? a male for a spirit. Malika Al Mahmoud has been a Mokdama in 2002, already for about 30 years. So now she's been 50. And she lived in Marrakesh, not too far from the royal palace. And she said that the Mokadema is the one who tells the Molem what to do. 
If the Malem is all by himself, but out a Malem, he does whatever he wants. He plays some mal and skips others. He does when I was a few in music hall. Mokadema is the whole tradition. Without the chief priestess who's organizing the ceremony, the Nubat are often rearranged and due to stress, they're simply not keeping as tightly to the tradition. This is how Ganawa begins to become inauthentic or does not have the intended effect. If you want to find real Ganawa, the Malika El Mahmoud, you'll find them at home. Not at the place of Jamal Fana, at the plaza they play to make money. Now I only play with Ganawa that will listen, but only if I find real Ganawa. There are Mokadamas like me that are hard. Everyone says Malika is hard because I don't accept the rituals be conducted in the wrong way. The Ganawa at Gemma Fana tell me I'm crazy because all they want is money. They just want to play music. It's like a police station without a police chief. Then the police do what they want. The Mokadama is like a police. She's talking about Taganawi, literally the attitude of Ganawa, the state of Ganawa, Ganawa net. And it is intangible and yet you know when the commercialization of Ganawa is something to be contested absolutely should be analyzed and whether or not it is truly being appreciated or if it's just being passively received by listeners who have come from abroad to attend the Ganawa World Music Festival or to attend Lila's or simply um, experience Ganawa music in passing as they, they travel through the country. Whatever your sentiments about police, Mokadema provide order. Mokadema ensure that there is no rowdiness or laxness with something so serious as a, a spiritual summoning. There does need to be a graciousness and a, a care that's shown to the spirits who choose to inhabit and visit. For example, Mira comes at sunrise. You play for Mira around the time of morning. The moon comes before Trafa, Isha, and Alaisha comes during the Lyalet or beforehand. The Lyalet being the suite for feminine spirits, which includes Lala, Mira, Malika, etc. These are the Amazigh spirits that are parts of the Ganawa tradition. Cohorts of spirit. Um, we can take you through them now. They are Musawin, the spirit. Samoin, the sky spirit. Humar, spirit of the abattoir, or sacrifice, the red sweet. Ulad al Gaba, the spirits of the forest. These are brown and black. Shodfa, the assistance of the prophet, you wear green or white. Lyalet, as I said, the feminine spirits, yellow, but various colors, not just, because Lala Malika is tied to purple. And Aisha, the ravishing, um, dangerous, but powerful spirit. Aisha Kandisha is considered to be part of this suite and you wear black. A critical borrowing sewed together a fragmented identity to make whole ones for the Ganawa, each one stitching together parts of their past. The same with the robe for Buderbala, a multi-patched robe, which was given to them by a member of the Hadawa. They have taken parts of their traumatic memory and fuse them into something that they can wear and gives them pride as opposed to shame. And Ganawa uses trance to work through that that pain. Aisha's last until midnight. 
but Leela's will last into the next morning or three days. And that's a Verdaba. The big noise is essentially what Verdaba means. That's been that Ganawa there. I'm celebrating Mali uh, five years ago, 2015. And that is celebration of the Prophet Muhammad's return to Earth. Muslims are commonplace throughout the land. Uh, holy festivals that observe Muslim holidays from Shaban to Ramadan. Adepts like Nagram eventually over time chose their spirit, Amluk, the blue sweet, Samoyin, spirits of the sky. Her first Lila, she was struck by Lala Amira and she experienced a dancing frenzy and she couldn't stop. And she passed out, and they gave her rose water, one of her ritual items, and incense. It was the yellow spirit. So I'm wearing dark blue for the spirits of the sky. Samoyin as well. Nagram decided that those would be the malut that she would follow because they came to her in the dream, and she drifted to them later on in her life. Because the sky has always been a draw for me and it's always had significance with the concept of heaven and the ancestors that I feel watch over me. I feel as if Samoyin was the easily most easily accessible suite that I could honor with this color. And light blue is for the spirit of the sea, uh, Musawin and Sidi Musa or the prophet Moses. So speaking of which, uh, happy Pesa her Passover, and Happy Mimuna. And I hope you enjoyed it. Devotees and Alada will carry two candles to represent Hajjaj, the two whirlwinds, and the world's beginning. One devotee will be carrying in front the Tabika, the platter, or the spirit offering. Before you enter the home or within it, henna will be applied to different parts of your body, from your arms to your hands to your feet. Different spirits will require different patterns for you. And you can find this paste on many zawiyas or shrines across Morocco, which can either be free to visit year-round or it can only be visited during the festival season. It comes with the ceremonial garb, gensha, small bag for your musical replacements, etc. Uh, ceremonial items are often only only for women too and sometimes mukademas will not leave these rooms until the music is playing not just to deter anyone from entering but because they're preparing themselves for the spiritual lila so it is zawiya is actually the oldest sainthood in morocco and it's dedicated to sidi bilal who again is the Ethiopian Muzan and servant to Prophet Muhammad and the first one to make the Adham. Zayed Ghania is from Asawira, as their entire family is. So she is head Mokadema over that shrine and she protects it well. We have two sources for Lala Isha here and we wanted to read them to you. To you. One is from Ganawa Stories, and the other is from, I believe, a blog post on Blogspot, and it's dedicated to northern Morocco. On the southern edge of Casablanca, along the ocean front boulevard, past luxurious condominiums, past the 21st century, lies Sidi Abdelman. A tiny rockly islet sanctuary that can only be reached by foot during low tide. Home to a saint of mysterious origins and a grotto dedicated to Aisha Kandisha, who is a feminine, goat footed spirit. The sanctuary attracts a growing number of pilgrims seeking favors, merchants selling anything from a tai to sanctified bimba, and the Ganawa who come here to entertain and give their blessings to Baraka like everyone else make a little money. Apart from the monetization that is affiliated with the different zawiyas, they are drawn to the significance of 
what these spirits mean and who these saints were for them. They themselves have the same multiplicity of identity and mystery about their origins as many of these saints and the spirits that they worship. So that connection does make sense. And yet I wonder how much is real and how much has just been embellished and then built upon over the years with legends such as Aisha Kandisha. Though the grotto is real and it isn't too far from Sidi Ben Amrush's, Sidi Abderman is a saint and several typos and such. This uh, Mokadama here is Rakia Bahawi. The, the head of the she applies is definitely putting her in a place that's more meditative and relaxed and happy. From the nomadic alternative, modes and models of interaction and in the African Asian desert steps. In the beginning, there was nothing but the black earth, which was sterile, the sea, firmament and night. Our world came from a serpent's egg, which was placed upon the sea and covered by the night, which made it fertile. Two whirlwinds, Bajaj, turning in opposite direction, made the egg crack. White fell first, and then evaporated and rose beyond the darkness. The red yolk sank into the black earth. The rock, which rested upon the subterranean waters, and there, like the white, it was divided upon seven parts. So that there are now seven earths and seven heavens. The efforts of the cosmos were directed towards reuniting these earths, and the red was to come out of the black earth like a serpent from the cave. This serpent of light is Dunia, and its sex was female, but its head was male. The rising Hajaj lifted it towards the sky like a cedar tree. It then penetrated the celestial sea and the star region of Aldebaran in order to reach the white earth. This was the first marriage consummated at night. As a result of the penetration of the fangs by the dunya, several new entities were born. The blood drank by the, the black earth, the sutra or the hymen of the sky, the veil of the white wool, which contained the seven colors, and milk water, the tree of Sidi Musa. This union also had the effect of setting the genies or muluk into motion. The black genies went up into the dunya and by way of the head penetrated into the white earth. On the other hand, the white genies of the celestial earth remain attached to the dunya, which was taken into the sutra. Bilal, the voice of the prophet, went up to the minaret to pronounce his profession of faith. His voice pierced the firmament of heaven, but he himself fell to his death pierced by the arrow. He landed at the feet of the prophet, who brought him back to life. The minaret is an image of the dunya that rises up. Since then, every Zerdava ceremony, since then, every Leela happens at night. It is the mystical union between heaven and earth, between our world and the next. They have constructed an entire mythos around the concept of night. So this is why we call our Facebook page Night Music, and this is also why Laio Night is the root word for Lila. This is Amina Mare. Uh, she's a Ganawa Mokadema in Casablanca, and her husband is Abdenvi El Qadari. You could be invited to Leela's and be stricken. You could be nowhere near the Ganawa or the music and find that TV Shamposh or La Lakia or CD Mamun has spoken to you, has struck you, Masu. The spirits are already unpredictable in their nature as it is, especially the spirits of the forest who are being shy away from it more public performances and more recent Kinawa suites. Perhaps today, La Lamilika will speak to you through the Mokadema 
and the next hour and the next two or three, that could be CD Hamol, that could be CD Musa, that could be Ule Zakba, that could be Baba Mugun. The feminine spirit, Amnis Lala Aisha, she's Lala Mimuna's daughter and the guardian of the thresholds, but not necessarily the black gate like her mother, Mimuna, the door to Sudan. Lala Aisha appreciates bounty, like Mimuna, as her mother is both this guardian spirit who rescued the Kanawa, but also synonymous with the Jewish beast Passover and the culmination of Mimuna. Aisha is visited at Springs and her specific grotto. How do you summon Aisha? Well, just two of her items, as we see from the music of the Kanawa of Morocco. Black olives, olives are one of her ritual items, and the absence of light, true darkness, is one way to summon Aisha. Emma McTally is, again, an Amazigh Jewish artist and designer who gave us very precious insight into who Mimuna is and how she became simply a Ginawa slash Jewish belief to a real life religious experience, a pilgrimage which people take every year. Some tell the story of how she saved the slave by showing up in the middle of the Sahara Desert and offering him a water canteen when he was about to die of thirst. The slave, who was inspired by the sound of the water in a leather canteen, later created Ganawa music and told others the story of Mimuna, his savior. Interestingly, Lala Mimuna today is a small village in the south of Morocco that was built around a water source named after the saint. Ganawa musicians head to the village of Lala Mimuna every year around the same time as Passover, three-day pilgrimage. Passover commemorates the journey from spiritual slavery to spiritual freedom, which is a central concept in Ganawa music. When I was a child, there were countless Ganawa groups that came from everywhere. The Baraka was very strong. I saw incredible things, but now it's been scraped away. There's only a few groups. That's Aida, and she's referring to capitalism's encroaching presence in Ganawa and how they were already placed as a disenfranchised minority. So Aisha has more than one form. There is a suite to Aisha, but she has different variations, and they can range from al Baharia, Aisha of the Sea, to the Hugia, which is a Hamacha version, to Kandisha, the, the Jean, or Sudania. Moroccans have ancient legends of Aisha Kandisha as a powerful priestess or a goat with a jean of Amazigh origin and a victor against all. <laughs> Hala Faitima Zora, Prophet Muhammad's daughter, is linked with green and white and sees her to Charafa's colors. The Charafa suite features Lafo, Ya Mulana, Bali, Adia, and more. This is actually a really amazing performance by the Ganawa Hadirat. <laughs> Ali left the Kauri and Mosque and Fez and moved to the Sarun Mountain for a quieter life. He instructed Sidi Ahmed, his disciple and servant, to run errands for him. These are both tests of manhood and worthiness as preparation for inheriting Baraka. He was directed firstly to overcome the fearsome of Del Haq, the son of Mule Ismail, known as the Beheader. He was instructed to travel to the Sudan to fetch and return the magical hat or exotic trance. Sidi Ahmed remarked that the Sudan was six months traveling. Sidi Ali instructed Sidi Ahmed to close his eyes. 
when he opened them again, he found he was outside of the king of Sudan's palace. Seeing all the guards were asleep, he entered the palace and found a wad, flute, a dof, drum, and Aisha, the king's wife. The combination formed the how that he was instructed to clean. Sidi Ahmed took them all with him, and the soldiers and the king awoke. The king asked them where his wife, his daf, and Aisha had gone. The soldiers said that they did not know, and assured them that no one had entered while he was asleep. The king guessed that it must have been Sidi Ahmed, who stole them, and ordered his soldiers to follow the saint to the Ain Qadir, the great spring on Mount Zarun. Sidi Ahmed sent a message by pigeon asking Sidi Ali to pray for him so that he would not be taken prisoner by the king of Sudan. Sidi Ali used his baraka, and the soldiers were all turned into frogs. When the king had died, his body was taken to the Ain al Rijal al Mule Adiristi and buried. After his burial, wherever the inhabitants of Mule Adiris prepared couscous or tajin, frogs drunk from their plate. To seek a remedy, the sacrifice was made to Mule Adiris, who woke and told them that they had brought the sacrifice to the wrong person to go to Sidi Ali bin Hamdush instead. The townspeople then went to Sidi Ali and told him that frogs were jumping all over the place. Sidi Ali told them who had sent him, and when he learned that it was Mullah Idris, he instructed them to return to their village where they would find a man dressed in a dilaba, sleeping. They were to ask him his advice, and he would tell them what to do. They found the man, woke him, and asked if it was he who had let out all of the frogs. The man asked them who had sent them, and they replied that it was Sidi Ali. He replied that they should perform the hal of Sidi Ali, and the problem was resolved. The people from Muladris agreed to do this and have followed and made sacrifices to Sidi Ali ever since. Sidi Ali returned to Mount Zarhun. He found his master Sidi Ali had died. He washed and buried his body in the spot where his Awiyah now stands, beside the spring of Ain Kabir. Sidi Ahmed then climbed to the top of Mount Zarhun, where he then became so upset that he cut himself with an axe as he called out all the names of the saints. His followers tried to calm him. They said that before Sidi Ali had died, he said, for you, Thursday, for me, Friday, by which he meant that Sidi Ahmed had inherited his baraka and would be visited first on Thursdays at the annual Mosam and the pilgrimage. Aisha, now without Sidi Ali, there to marry or to serve, began to undertake miracles of healing. She healed those who had come from afar, from the desert, to Algeria, to Tunisia, and beyond. She saw many people before suddenly disappearing, and no one ever knew what became of her or where she went. Her cave, however, remained and became a pilgrimage site just downhill from the Zawiya of Sidi Ali ben Abdu and Sidi Abderrahman. Despite the fact that she was no longer there, the cave, a great fig tree would grow there and became a place where one could bring sacrifice, light candles, and be healed. This practice entered the tradition. As people continued to visit and live within the proximity of her past and her continuing miracles, some consider her to live there, even though some suggest that she has no home and just visits as one of her shrines. This is why Aisha is part of the multicolored suite, the wanderers who heal and are considered saints but have no particular set location. <laughs> Malika's colors are mauve or purple or black. She's Fassi from Fez. Flirtatious, beautiful, and an Algerian Jewish royalty. So her lineage makes sense. Um, she's always been lavish, and her eponymous song comes from Talfilaut near the border of Morocco and Algeria and the Sahara. She has a Amazi rhythm to her, her music. It is very much um, southeastern Morocco, but also that of Amazi, Algeria. Her spirit is untamable, it's vivacious, it's fiery. The legend goes that she was married to a pious Muslim and fell ill, but only to pretend that she didn't have to fulfill the general like salah and prayers and since she was more of a liberal jewish 
queen. She wanted an hour, at the very least, to do whatever she wanted and to live more freely, and he allowed that for her. So Lala Malika, there's an hour for her in the city of Fez now, Malika's hour. And during the ceremony in the Lila, there is a tone of joy and very into how we we look and we want to make sure that we're beautiful. Henna, grape or raisin juice, lipstick, duak. Mirrors and sandalwood are some of the ritual items. Mimuna has great respect as mother of Ganawa. The door to Sudan or Black Africa. And this can allude to either the, the Red Sea is parting by Moses' God given power, Mimuna, after Passover, and the celebration of Lady Luck, because Mimun means fortune. The translation of Ganawa lyrics of that Asia for La La Mimuna. Here she comes, Lady Muna. Here she comes, Lady Fortuna, bringing joy to all and sundry with bounty. We never go hungry, beloved Lady Muna. <laughs> And so they're both the main duo, a guardian over the black fleet. The followers may use knives. You can see in adept on the Kanawa stream page there, and she's not bleeding at all. There is something to be said for this state of trance, absolving you of the pain that you would otherwise feel. Now, Mimuna is offered Dagmu, like Karosa. It's a, uh, a crushed spread. In this particular case, I think it's it's crushed grain, but it's sweetened with date and matica. Spiced juices, honey, unsalted and unleavened bread, much like a Passover kiara platter would contain, too, are offered to Mimuna. This lila is led by uh, Abdella Ghania from the uh, Esuera Malan family. And actually, Benat Ghania makes some appearances as well. Lala Mira is a joyous and very playful, but tempestuous Amazigh queen who induces dance. She's royalty, much like Malika. And Nagaram, who was included in Ganawa's stories 20 years ago. They're Maluka the Samoan now, but when she was inhabited by Amira, she danced and danced dance like a mad woman. Passed out, she said. They put rose water in my mouth and gave me incense. So they gave her the ritual items for Mira because they realized that she had been inhabited by her. And she requires no designs for her henna, simply just the bright powder on your hands and your feet, yellow for her. Eggs, henna, no patterns necessary. And San Sujawi, yellow, musk, rose water, and sweet. She loves sweet things. So it might be more than one spirit. La La Rakia is a Marakshi saint, and she is summoned for healing and fertility. Much like the white sweet or the Chorafa is associated with healing, so is La La Rakia. And enjoy the song by late Malam Master uh, C. Mohammed Chauti. <laughs>
Al Bashawriya broke ground as an Algerian musician and an unapologetic Gambri player. And she was born in the main birthplace of Ganawa, which is Bashar, Algeria. The Gambri and I have a bit of history, she says. My father was a Ganawa master and I wasn't allowed to touch this instrument. When I dared to do so, I left the Gambri alone and I started on the guitar. It was only in 1999 that I finally came back to it in France for the Women of Algeria Festival. I was invited, and it was only then that I let them play at the Gambri. When I arrived in Paris, I dreamed of my father saying, go ahead. These songs are almost like family for musicians there in the Sahara. I grew up with them. And then you decided to play the Gambri and claim that as your musical aspiration. I'm glad that she received that blessing in her dreams. But not how Ariat have collaborated with everyone from Karim Ziad and Peter Gabriel to Morocco's most beloved masters. And this is Khadija that you saw earlier with um, Benato Ariat on television and playing La La Malika. <laughs> Kanawa and Malam Abdembi El Manaknesi, that was around 2009, as Noha said. And officially in 2011 is when they started to tour and perform across Morocco and then internationally. And they have been a shining beacon for change ever since then. Razma Hamzoui, uh, she leads the net in Boktu and the Kastawi or Kastablanca style since 2012. And she got encouragement from her father, Malem Rashid Hamzoi. She's played with Marrakesh Malem, Mustafa Baku, and other esteemed musicians. And the world has come together to appreciate and respect Asma and the Nazi book too. He might not have a son, but he loves the idea of being the first Moroccan Kanawa master to transmit his teachings to a female performer, says Asma. Amzoi is a fabulous leader with her own feelings about the rise of Malems, the popularity in that title across Kanawa, despite the lack of Taganawi or Kanawa authenticity. There are too many people calling themselves Malem these days when they're not. I feel like there should be an institution set up of real masters who can then grade these artists and give them the title. I am a long way from that. But she says she's happy to just be out playing and to be accepted, special to document over time. People film Lila's without permission. Ma and Malika, Zaida, and others have stressed. Conservative attitudes about women across Morocco have not stopped the acceleration of a new era. Zaha Kokia and Maid Baraka continue to shine upon. Malamas, Mokademas, and Ganawia. I leave you with this performance by Asma Bashariya. Oh,